Yes, I assure you. As long as we're here, you won't have anything to worry about. Never feel like all this meddling we do is wrong? Nope. Me neither. Tournament arcs are nothing new, and have become something of a staple of shonen battle anime. Arguably popularized by the Dragon Ball franchise, the story structure has gone on to make appearances in plenty of anime, including Shaman King, Pokemon, Naruto, Hunter x Hunter, My Hero Academia, and basically any sports anime in existence. But there's one tournament arc that, in my personal opinion, stands head and shoulders above all the others in terms of what it brought to the table, and that's the infamous Dark Tournament from Yu Yu Hakusho. With the show hitting Netflix and being exposed to a new generation of anime enthusiasts, I figured now was a perfect time to have this discussion. In order to make this video more coherent instead of me just rambling about how much I love this arc and what's arguably my favorite anime tied only with Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, I'm going to break this up into sections so that I can focus my thoughts a bit. This will be a much longer video than my more recent discussions, so grab a drink or some snacks and buckle in. From here on out, there will be massive story spoilers for Yu Yu Hakusho. It's a fantastic classic anime that you could probably binge in a week or so, so go do that and come back. Or at the very least, watch from episode 22 through 66. That covers the prelude to the Dark Tournament, as well as the tournament itself. Since we're skipping past all of their introductions in the show, it's important that we take the time to discuss who we spend all of our time with during the Dark Tournament, as understanding or at least having a baseline knowledge of who they are is important for their development during this chunk of the anime. Yusuke Irameshi is our lead character, and the one we've gotten to know the most up to this point. To grossly oversimplify for the sake of time, Yusuke was a high school delinquent that constantly got into fights, skipped school, and just generally caused headaches for the adults around him. His entire life and perspective on life changed after he was struck by a car and killed while trying to save the life of a little boy. His uncharacteristic act of kindness brought on the attention of Botan, a grim reaper who informs Yusuke that no one expected him to die prematurely like that. So she offers him his life back. After attending his own funeral as a ghost in a scene that always makes me tear up, Yusuke finally sees that his life truly meant something to the people he constantly caused trouble for. After jumping through some hoops, he's given his life back and becomes a spirit detective, someone who patrols the human world on behalf of Spirit World to make sure everything remains hunky-dory. Kazuma Kuwabara is Yusuke's longtime rival and one of the few people that was truly heartbroken by his death. He and Yusuke fist fought all the time and though Kuwabara always lost, he developed a respect for Yusuke. There was an unspoken honor and friendship between them, even though it was dysfunction at its finest. Kuwabara becomes wrapped up in one of Yusuke's early cases, and the two slowly but surely deepen their friendship as he assists Yusuke on cases to come. Kuwabara is always looking for avenues to surpass Yusuke and kind of feels like an early iteration of the dynamic between Deku and Bakugo, though Yusuke is far less problematic and abusive than Bakugo. Kuwabara is loud and boisterous, but he has the biggest heart of everyone in the cast. Kurama is a fox demon trapped in a human body that Yusuke meets during one of his early cases. At first, Kurama is Yusuke's target after the demon steals a powerful artifact from Spirit World with the help of Hiei and some other guy who no one cares about. When Yusuke confronts Kurama, he discovers that the man stole the artifact because it was the only thing capable of curing his dying mother's illness. The artifact would grant the wish of anyone, but it would consume their life force in the process. Yusuke empathizes with Kurama and aids his cause, allowing the demon to walk away with his life and continue living with his mother. From this point onward, Kurama acts as a powerful ally to Yusuke and his team. Kurama is sophisticated, calculating, and immeasurably kind to everyone in their party. However, as we'll see later, there is much more to him buried under the surface. Hiei is a demon that clashes with Yusuke during the same case that brought him into contact with Kurama. Unlike Kurama, Hiei's case isn't so noble, and he even goes as far as to kidnap Yusuke's love interest Keiko and nearly succeeds in turning her into a demon. Yusuke, with the assistance of Kurama, succeeds in thwarting Hiei's plan, and Hiei ends up serving his punishment by working on behalf of Spirit World. His punishment is what originally forces him into Yusuke's crew of misfits, but he does eventually develop the respect for Yusuke and to a much lesser extent Kuwabara. Hiei and Kurama have an established rapport, and as the only other demon in the group, Hiei has something of a soft spot for the man. Hiei is unapologetically callous and detached, respecting power over emotion. A few moments ago, I compared Kuwabara to Deku in his desire to be acknowledged by Yusuke. Hiei's desire to surpass Yusuke is very much akin to how Vegeta is always looking to outshine Goku. Genkai is the crabbiest, most wholesome old lady ever. She is a wildly powerful psychic whose reputation precedes her on Earth, in the spirit world, and in the demon world. When she announces that she'll be taking on a pupil early in the series, people flock from far and wide to be her student, and she whittles down the numbers through games and challenges 
culminating in a tiny tournament arc that ends with Yusuke coming out victorious. She agrees to teach him, but Yusuke has no idea just how brutal her training would be. Genkai does not pull her punches and expects the absolute best from Yusuke. She can respond to Yusuke's sarcasm with plenty of her own, which makes them an amusing duo to watch. As time goes on, she becomes something of a mother figure to Yusuke's group, and develops a very real soft spot for Yusuke himself. Now, a couple of characters who you don't need to know in depth, but it helps with context for later situations. Koenma Jr. is basically the toddler son of the man that rules Spirit World and acts as Yusuke's boss. He still has a lot to learn about what it means to be a good leader, but he's put a lot of faith in Yusuke. Botan is the first person Yusuke meets after dying, and she becomes the go-between for Yusuke and Koenma Jr. She often gives him helpful advice, new cases, and acts like an older sister, offering him help where she can. Keiko is Yusuke's childhood friend and love interest. They have a very dysfunctional relationship in the beginning, but Keiko never once loses sight of the good inside Yusuke, actively pushing him to do and be better as a person and friend. Following the first major story arc of the anime, The Saint Beasts, Yusuke is given a new mission by Koenma to rescue a demon girl named Yukina, who is being held prisoner by a man that can only be described as a living testicle. Yukina is being held due to her ability to produce rare and priceless gems that are formed by her tears. Kuwabara is love-struck by the sight of the woman and volunteers to join Yusuke on his new assignment, but leaves before he is informed that Yukina is actually Hiei's sister. Yusuke and Kuwabara do what they do best and kick some ass, tearing through Turukune, the criminal's estate, to get to Yukina. At the same time, the criminal is hosting a panel of mysterious men who place bets on when the intruders will be killed and by who. One of the members of the panel, Sakio, seems to favor Yusuke and Kuwabara and repeatedly wins. However, Turukune has an ace up his sleeve. He contacted the services of the Togoro brothers, who are known for their power. Up to this point, the Togoros have stayed out of the fight to stand as a final challenge for the teenage boys. All that stands between Yusuke, Kuwabara, and Victory are the Togoro brothers. Before the fight begins, Sakio wagers an obscene amount of money on victory for Yusuke and Kuwabara. The amount of money is very specific, as combined with the money he's already won, it would completely clean out Tarukane for everything he's got. The battle begins and it becomes very clear very quickly that Yusuke and Kuwabara are dangerously outmatched. They take one hell of a beating before ending the battle with a clever combination of Yusuke's signature attack, the spirit gun, and Kuwabara's signature weapon, the spirit sword. With the two coming out on top, Sakio wins his bet and effectively renders Tarukane penniless. Yusuke and Kuwabara rescue Yukina and they leave. Shortly after the case is closed, Yusuke, while on a date with Keiko, is unnerved by some damage done to a nearby building. Sensing something is off, he goes on high alert where he's confronted by a motorist who reveals himself to be the younger Togoro brother who, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to refer to as the definitive Togoro. We'll call the elder Togoro brother E.T. since he kinda weirds me out on a primal level. Anyway, after Togoro reveals himself to be alive and well, there's a very real fear to Yusuke. He and Kuwabara gave everything they had in their fight and barely came out on top. Togoro coerces Yusuke into following him with a thinly veiled threat to Keiko, and Kuwabara arrives just in time to see the two leaving, which actively distresses him as well. Togoro takes Yusuke to a parking garage and admits that during his fight with the boys, he only used 20% of his power, then proceeds to demonstrate what 60% looks like, destroying the entire structure. Not only is he much stronger than Yusuke, he's far faster too. He goes on to explain that Yusuke and Kuwabara have been invited to that year's dark tournament as special guests. Togoro explains that attendance for the guest team is mandatory, and that if Yusuke refuses, Togoro will kill him, his friends, and everyone they know. Not everyone they care about, everyone they know. The demonstration of power was to motivate Yusuke to get stronger so that he has a chance at surviving the enemies to come and eventually give Togoro a legitimate fight when the time comes. It's the first time we see Yusuke so legitimately afraid of something that he can't move, nor are there any quippy remarks to deflate his enemy's words. Kuwabara was watching from nearby, and that same fear is evident in him as well. On Togoro's way out, he spots Kurama and Hiei standing at the top of a building and assumes by their grim expressions that they've also been invited to compete on behalf of Yusuke's team. The threat level has been adequately established, as has the gap in power between our protagonists and their main adversary. It's not as though the power gap is decent but surmountable. If we were to compare it to distance at this point in the story, it would be like the distance between Earth and the Moon. The audience was given a small taste of what the story arc's big bad can do, and as we see later, he could have very well been lying about how much power he was actually using. 
There's a case to be made that he was actually using far less power than stated during his demonstration with Yusuke, based on his actions and words later in the story, but that's neither here nor there. As the audience, this setup has us spinning our wheels wondering what crazy trials Yusuke is not only going to have to endure to be able to compete with Tagoro on equal footing, but what the opponents leading up to that will be like as well. It makes us question the strength we thought our protagonists had. Even Kurama and Hiei end up training to prepare for the coming storm. The stakes for this arc are astoundingly high for the entire team, as they all stand to lose quite a bit if they are defeated in the tournament. Yusuke would lose Keiko, his mother, Genkai, his school principal, likely Botan, and anyone else Tagoro could get his hands on. Kuwabara would lose his sister and all of his school buddies, Kurama would lose his human mother who he's grown to care for deeply during his time of being raised by her, Hiei would lose Yukina, the only family he has left, even though she has no idea who he is. Everyone involved has something significant to lose aside from their lives, and the preamble to this arc does a masterful job of making the audience worry for them. The inflection point for the Dark Tournament sets itself apart from other arcs with similar structures by its nature alone. With Dragon Ball, Goku wanted to test his strength against other strong warriors with some narrative layered in. In most sports anime, the characters just want to be the best team. In My Hero Academia, it was a means of showing off their quirks and skills to the world to further their future careers as heroes. In Shaman King, the characters competed to be the Shaman King, and, and so on. In each of those cases, there is a degree of choice afforded to the characters, and the penalty for failure was modest at best and often isolated to only the characters competing. If a character failed, there is a very real chance of trying again at a later date. That choice is completely stripped from Yusuke and his team, who have no desire to fight in the infamous martial arts tournament. The penalty for failure also removes that mindset of, oh, I'll just try again later, which stacks on another layer of stress for Team Urameshi. The threat of powerful adversaries and the astronomical stakes combined also organically spur the characters into needing to get stronger. A lot of anime with training segments kind of amount to, hey, I'm pretty strong, but I could be stronger, you know? But in this show's case, the mindset of the characters is, oh shit, if I don't train my ass off, I am literally going to die. With the stakes for our heroes laid out plain as day, the tournament shows another of its strengths right at the beginning. Each team that interacts with Yusuke's is memorable with charming, powerful, and often sympathetic characters. It would be easy to give each team one memorable character to act as the biggest obstacle, but the show goes out of its way to make sure each opponent sticks with you in some way. Some characters are memorable for their amusing antics, some are memorable for their overall motivations, some are memorable for what they draw out of one of our heroes, and plenty are combinations of the three. Yu Yu Hakusho does a fine job in avoiding the easy route, providing every struggle that Team Urameshi faces with interesting characters. Uh, he's just standing there, menacingly! The only real time this doesn't happen is when Team Urameshi isn't in the ring. Instead, they're watching Team Taguro completely obliterate an opposing team. But since this is more of a demonstration of the monstrous power of the younger Taguro brother and the looming threat Yusuke has to face, the enemies don't need to be quirky or memorable. The diversity of personalities on display isn't tethered solely to behavior either. Each enemy that stands between Team Urameshi and survival comes with their own combat styles, dangerous techniques, and refreshing character designs. Let's go through the major teams our boys face off against so you can see what I mean. The Dark Tournament kicks off with Team Urameshi vs Team Rokuyukai. Team Rokuyukai consists of Rinku, Roto, Ziru, and Chu. There are six members of the team, but two of them serve to set up the personality of Chu, so they don't, they don't matter at all, they don't even get names. Rinku is the first to fight, and we immediately get a feel for his personality. He treats the match against Kuwabara like a joke, casually toying with him until Kuwabara actively appears to begin turning the tables. Rinku reveals that he was only pretending to let Kuwabara win, but when his attempt to put Kuwabara down for good fails, his jovial demeanor fades. His weapon of choice is a series of yo-yos, appropriate for a child combatant, and it suits his aesthetic. Toward the end of the fight, you genuinely see some childlike innocence from Rinku. Rokuyukai's second is Roto, who is just as shady as he looks. He is very clearly outmatched by Kurama, and the only way for him to level the field is by using underhanded tactics. As stated earlier, Kurama has a human mother that he cares about quite a bit, and Roto knows that. To turn the tide in his favor, he reveals that with the press of a button, his brother will kill Kurama's mother. Naturally, this is enough to prevent Kurama from attacking, and Roto further demonstrates what a shit he is by demanding that Kurama lick his boot. 
What's brilliant about this character is how he shines a spotlight on how clever Kurama can be when backed into a corner. It sets the stage for the viewer to wonder what cool strategies Kurama will use to claim victory. Ziru fights third, pitted against Hiei, two arrogant demons with fire techniques. Ziru is a no-nonsense kind of demon and immediately attempts to intimidate Hiei. He comes off as impatient as Hiei mocks him, but his personality actually isn't the focus of this battle. The fight with Ziru serves two purposes. It introduces us to Hiei's ever-present desire to dominate any fight he's in, as well as opens the door for his signature technique, Dragon of the Darkness Flame. After that, we get introduced to one of the most memorable characters to be introduced in the tournament, the final fighter of Rukuyakai, Chu. He's a genuinely amusing and charismatic drunk with an Aussie accent, assuming you're watching the fantastic dub. We're introduced to Chu through him stumbling into the ring to make sure that he's allowed to fight after the two unnamed team members accidentally die after trying to flee. Yusuke is his opponent this time around, and unlike the matches before, the two develop a mutual respect for each other. Chu could have easily trespassed into the territory of being obnoxious, but his flips between a drunken goof and a ferocious combatant keep him intriguing for the audience. Alongside some characters we'll discuss in a bit, it's always interesting to see Chu interact with other established characters. Over the course of the match between the teams, we get another glimpse of the men that were gambling during the prelude to the Dark Tournament. We see that their entire motivation, with the exception of Sakyo, is consolidating and acquiring wealth. Each member of the Shady Group owns and sponsors one of the teams, with Koenma Jr. owning Team Urameshi and Sakyo owning Team Tagoro. Sakyo is a character that we haven't really spoken about yet, but he is certainly important to the overall plot of the Dark Tournament. He's, in a sense, the man behind the scenes, pulling strings to bring his goals to fruition. He and Tagoro have a very cordial business relationship, speaking candidly to one another, and it gives us interesting glimpses into the remaining traces of humanity Tagoro has left. Sakyo's motivations only align with Tagoro's in the sense that he wants to see his team beat Urameshi's, but that's as far as the overlap goes. Beyond that point, their motivations diverge drastically, offering an A plot and a B plot, both of which have a direct link to the next major story arc. For the time being, we'll skip Tagoro's motivations for dragging Yusuke into this shit show because they coincide with the actions and motivations of another, so when the time comes, we'll discuss them together. For now, let's move on to Team Ichigaki, which will take less time to explain based solely on the nature of the team and their motivations. Dr. Ichigaki is a balding gremlin scientist with an ego problem who is using the tournament as a means of testing the strength of his own inventions at the expense of his three main warriors, as well as to attempt to claim Yusuke as a test subject, understanding how unique Yusuke is compared to most humans. Dr. Ichigaki and his victim's stories run parallel to one another in one of the more interesting ways. The three human warriors entered into Ichigaki's command under the belief that he could cure their dying master of an unnamed illness. The agreement was that in exchange for his medical help, they would allow themselves to be used as test subjects for his experiments. Unbeknownst to them though, the invention the doctor wanted to test would rob them of their agency, turning them into killing machines at his beck and call. These conflicting but complementary motivations add an empathetic layer to the warriors. You want them to find a cure for their master, but you also know Yusuke's team needs to win. Characters like this add emotional tension to the fight that isn't lost on any of Team Urameshi. As the details come out, it actively changes how Team Urameshi approaches the fight. Moral dilemmas, dilemmas? Moral dilemmas are often absent in standard tournament arcs, especially so early in the competition, but Yu Yu Hakusho does everything it can to make each match matter in some manner or another. This match also reinforces how compassionate of a character Kubara is while simultaneously inking the blueprint for a pivotal scene to come late in the arc. Before we talk about Team Masho, I think now is a perfect time to supplement the previously mentioned information regarding the shady men who use the Dark Tournament as a gambling platform. You see, each team owner appears to be wagering staggering amounts of money on their own crews to win, though with Team Tagoro's presence, I don't see why they'd risk entire fortunes. Anyway, in order to stack the deck in their favor and remove Team Urameshi from the table, which I guess now that I think about it would come with a pretty incredible payday, the team owners do not shy away from rigging the game in their favor. For example, immediately following the hard-fought victory over Team Ichigaki, the tournament committee immediately starts the third round, forcing Yusuke's team to have to fight again right then and there, despite the condition they're in. It's not the first time the strings are pulled, and it certainly isn't the last. What makes this so intriguing to watch is its additional sense of tension. We as the audience know the committee is being unfair and we can see how tired our heroes are. 
so it's stressful to watch as the situations grow more and more dire for every single one of them. I know these guys are cheating us. I know you're angry, and heck, I know what happens if we lose. <laughs> but if you and he ain't go on some tirade destroying people till you get your way, you'll be just like them. Let's win this thing clean. Like, like men. The lack of transparency from the adversaries paired with the strength of their opponents highlights an awesome trait of Team Urameshi. They're not overpowered bulldozers. Just like any of us, they struggle and they have to think on their feet every time they get screwed over. At every level of the tournament, they're given a brick wall and told to break it down with nothing more than their bare hands and their resolve. Onward to Team Masho. It consists of a set of unique characters with interesting designs, attitudes, and even speech patterns. Considering Team Masho consists of Spirit World's rendition of ninjas, it would have been immensely easy to forego giving each character an actual personality in favor of a gimmick. While each member of Team Masho has a fundamentally different personality, some of which certainly clash, they share a singular motivation. They want a place to call their own. Typically in their world and in ours, ninjas are relegated to the shadows. If Team Masho were to win the tournament, they would be awarded ownership of the very island the tournament is taking place on, a home of their own. A place to call home is something everyone can relate to, so it paints the less belligerent members of Team Masho with an empathetic brush. The first member to fight is Gama, admittedly one of the least interesting visually, but he has a very interesting power set that has a domino effect on the rest of the round. It's gonna sound weird, but he uses traditional battle makeup to channel his energy and amplify his own combat attributes. In concept, it's pretty dang neat when you think about it. What really makes this technique interesting is that it's not just a tool he can use to buff himself. If he marks his opponent, in this case Karama, he can actively debuff them by doing things like making Karama feel as though he's being weighed down, drastically reducing his agility, or worse, locking his opponent's spirit energy inside of them. The end of this fight shows us again how clever Karama can be when backed into a corner, but at the same time, we're shown how his overconfidence and compassion can work against him. Karama firmly believes the fight has been won, and technically it has, but Gama had one last trick up his sleeve, something Karama didn't see coming because he assumed the dying man was just pointlessly flailing around. It's in the revelation that Gama had sealed Karama's spirit energy inside him that we get to see the loyalty Gama has to his sect, even in death. All he cares about is that by sealing Karama's energy, he's further handicapped the already struggling Team Yurameshi. In his eyes, he's guaranteed victory for his own team by putting Karama at such a severe disadvantage. With that in mind, he knows his death won't be in vain. At this point, Karama has been completely screwed by Gama. Because his arms and legs are still weighed down by Gama's first curse, Karama is unable to remove himself from the ring before the next fight can start against Toya, the Master of Ice. Toya is actually the character that explains what it is Timasha hopes to gain from the tournament. There's a clear frustration in his explanation as he reflects on the glimpses of the human world. Of all the members of Team Masha, Toya seems to be the most fundamentally disciplined. His speech is very concise and he wastes no time bringing the pain to Karama, and we get to see that Toya is just as clever as our beloved redhead. This is genuinely one of the most interesting matches in the entirety of the tournament based on the mechanics as well as the banter between the men. There's a sense of understanding between them, and even a hint towards Karama's backstory. Bakken is the next member in the ring, and he does the one thing you should never do. He genuinely angers Yusuke on a fundamental level. He's definitely the least likable fighter of Team Masho, both in terms of his skill set as well as his abrasive personality. He's annoyed that his shinobi sect has been humiliated, and he willfully ignores the referee's order to stop so that she can perform a 10 count. Bakken is one of the few characters in the entire arc that strictly serves a narrative purpose, with that purpose being to show just how far the tournament committee is willing to go in order to screw over Team Yurameshi. Aside from that, his presence allows us another peek into how protective Yusuke is when it comes to his friends, consequences be damned. The penultimate fight with Team Masho features Jin, the Windmaster. Jin is hands down my favorite new character to be introduced via the tournament. I know a lot of people complain about his accent, but to me, his voice and speech pattern are what make him so endearing. Though since I'm talking exclusively about the English dub, I can't validate if this holds up in the sub. He's insanely charming and quite funny in his own right. Unlike most of the fighters to make their debut, Jin comes out of the gate with a very carefree personality. He makes jokes and laughs, he's genuinely excited to square off against Yusuke after watching him fight. There's no malice or insidious intent to Jin, and it's refreshing. In that same vein, he's very much like Chu from earlier in the arc. While he and Yusuke both fight for their aforementioned reasons, 
There's a mutual respect the two find in one another through their love of fighting. Despite how powerful Jin demonstrates himself to be, he never underestimates Yusuke. At all turns, he treats the spirit detective like a true threat and tweaks his tactics accordingly. Last to fight is Risho, a smug, insufferable douchebag with an ego as large as Elon Musk's. Unfortunately, thanks to more skullduggery by the corrupt tournament committee, the injured Kuwabara is forced to step into the ring and fight. Despite the tournament committee giving Team Masha basically all of their wins, Risho spends most of the match being condescending to Kuwabara. That sense of superiority over Kuwabara extends to Risho's lack of using his battle techniques, beating Kuwabara senseless with his bare hands. It isn't until Kuwabara annoys Risho by simply refusing to give up that the shinobi finally unveils his power. The biggest takeaway from this clash is how it highlights Kuwabara's willingness to make tough choices in order to ensure the survival of his allies, again planting the seeds for a scene to come later in the arc. Team Yuri Otogi is the last team Yusuke's crew faces before the fated showdown with Team Togoro, and between the two masterminds of their team, it is made clear from the beginning that what they're really after is just a sense of fame. The perceived leader, Shishi Wakamaru, also goes so far as to urge Team Yurameshi to give them a good battle in order to further amplify their race to fame. The battles are decided by Dice Troll, with Hiei taking the first fight against Makintaro. To be frank, there's nothing much to this battle, it mostly serves to show that Hiei has returned to fighting shape and allows him to be pretty stylish to boot. Kuro Momotaro is the second to fight, with Hiei again standing in the ring as the contender. Kuro is something of a meathead, akin to the typical frat guy, but packs an interesting skill set. In contrast to Team Yurameshi's tight-knit alliance, Kuro shows no regard for his fallen comrade. We get to see Hiei on the back foot for this battle, which is something that has yet to occur outside of his defeat by Yusuke himself in the early days. Hiei's confidence takes a small blow, and there's an uncertainty to his game plan. It isn't often we see the unflappable Hiei back away from an opponent, and it keeps what could have been a silly fight pretty tense. Yuri Urishima takes to the arena next and faces off against Kurama. Yuri cements himself as a wolf in sheep's clothing as he demonstrates how reliant he is on tricking his opponent into empathizing with him, only to unveil a devious plot. It exploits the things about Kurama that Hiei often derides him for, his sense of compassion for others, as well as his habit of holding back until he understands his opponent's methods. While the fight itself isn't the most fulfilling from a combat perspective, it's the concepts and peeks into Kurama's past that truly give the audience something meaningful to chew on. It's a pivotal moment in the tournament for Kurama as he's forced to acknowledge a part of himself he'd long since laid to rest. Shishi Wakamaru is the next to fight, stacked against the ever-optimistic oaf Kuwabara. As is the case with just about everyone, Shishi clowns Kuwabara. His pompous attitude is heavily tied to his fanbase, which can be seen displaying signs and cheering him on from the stands. The fight is not long at all. Shishi remains in the ring and the masked fighter, by this point revealed to be Genkai, squares up. The man drops all pretenses as Genkai's identity is revealed to the tournament crowd. His goal comes to light again, noting that he won't need to wait to fight Togoro to achieve celebrity status if he kills Genkai. Shishi Wakamaru's pursuit for fame makes him willing to unleash a hellish attack that brings harm to the crowd, despite the fact that plenty of his own supporters are in the stands. The old man Onji is the last to fight. Again, Kuwabara has to step into the ring and again he gets clowned. Genkai is chosen to fight next and immediately sees through her opponent's disguise. Turns out Onji is actually a character named Suzuka. He is a literal clown whose ego eclipses everyone who has come before him. As vain and flamboyant as they come, he's the team's true leader, thirsting for fame more ravenously than even Shishi Wakamaru. Beauty is the pinnacle of creation in Suzuka's eyes, which causes him to look down upon and vastly underestimate Genkai. Everything the man does has an egregious and colorful flair to it in both visuals and tone, which flies in the face of the otherwise grim depiction of the Dark Tournament. Before we talk about the fight with Team Togoro, which deserves a section in itself, I want to highlight what allows the Dark Tournament to be as long as it is without ever overstaying its welcome. While a bulk of the tournament arc is spent in the ring, a significant amount of time is spent following the characters outside the ring both during and between rounds. The fighting is the main course, while the small moments between supplement the action like appetizers. Characters are given time to breathe, be themselves, and interact with one another in the absence of life or death stakes. It's these moments, big and small, that keep this 40 episode arc from feeling bloated or running too long. At each turn, we get glimpses of how our characters think and feel. 
We watched them laugh and enjoy card games with each other, bringing moments of levity to what could very well be their last days among the living. We're given small but interesting details like how Tagoro prefers orange juice over alcohol, or how Koenma Jr. decides to take on the form of an adult because he's tired of being made fun of, or even how people that Yusuke have beaten have come to respect him immensely. There's genuine tenderness between Yusuke and Keigo in that cute but dysfunctional kind of way. We get to see where Kuwabara gets his toughness from and just goes on and on. Yusuke has to deal with the idea that he still may not be strong enough to beat Tagoro, and we get glimpses of that fear anytime the two lock eyes. Yusuke puts on a good front, but as the audience, the anxiety is tangible, especially after Team Yurimeshi watches Tagoro single-handedly bring down an entire team. Kurama's past is brought to the surface, which unearths a long-forgotten desire to be free of his human body, or at the very least, have the ability to shift between forms at will. His own fear is exacerbated as he realizes he can't defeat Karasu of Team Tagoro without the advantage afforded to him by his demon form. It sets him down a path of trying to discover a way to reliably tap into his full strength, and like Yusuke, we see that anxiety mounting. Hiei's moments outside the ring revolve around his injury and how that injury will eventually lead him to being less reckless. Even Hiei begins to see that he has limitations, and without strengthening himself further, he cannot protect himself or his sister. Hiei's arc is a bit more subtle than Yusuke and Kurama's, as it's mostly done through body language and soft changes in how he acts and speaks to those around him. Kuwabara's arc centers around his sense of duty, starting with the fight against Team Ichigaki and the empathy that comes with that. He's very in tune with the emotions of those around him, or so he thinks, and that comes full circle for him during the finals, which we'll get to momentarily. Even Keiko goes through growth, graduating from just being the stick in the mud who wants Yusuke to grow up, to realizing Yusuke finds joy in fighting, but also that despite how childish he can be, he loves it. For Keiko, the dark tournament serves as a lens that burns through all of the bravado and loudmouthed buffoonery to give her a true glimpse of Yusuke. The moments between show us just how shitty the tournament committee can be, alongside the chilling cunning of Sakio and Tagoro's business agreement. Any moment that isn't spent knee-deep in the action is spent building up the characters in the atmosphere, using everything in the playbook to keep the audience invested emotionally. It offers us time to just observe Team Yurameshi in their free time, instead of forcing us to sit through an endless stream of fights or sports matches. In any other tournament arc I've seen, all of the excitement was in the showdowns themselves. It would be incredibly disingenuous to say that I didn't care about the moments between in other tournament arcs, but none of them kept me nearly as glued to my screen as the supplementary scenes of the Dark Tournament, and I've seen the show from start to finish way more time than I care to admit. There's an organic curiosity when we're taken out of the ring to follow another character, and things are given enough weight to make you give a damn, and sometimes those small moments really affect the course of the main plot. When Yusuke is laughing with or being civil to former opponents, it makes you think of how far he's come as a person. When Kuwabara is swooning over Yukina, it makes you root for the big oaf to get the girl. When Kurama is puzzling over something, it makes you want to figure out a solution before him. When he is around, it makes you want to encourage him to tell Yukina he's her brother. When Tagoro is chatting outside the ring, it makes you wonder how in the hell Yusuke is going to win against him. All of these feelings stem from the little moments we get to spend with everyone, and I'd argue that without these moments, the Dark Tournament wouldn't be nearly as memorable as it is. Without the highs and lows our characters experience morally and emotionally, the Dark Tournament would be just as empty as the fighting in Dragon Ball Super. Flashy and fun to look at, but nothing to write home about. Genkai and Yusuke have something of a turbulent relationship when they first meet, and that's putting it lightly. Everything Yusuke knows about utilizing his power he learned from Genkai. She's definitely top of the list in terms of best anime grandmas. Their relationship as mentor and pupil comes to a head during the semifinals of the Dark Tournament, when Genkai decides it's time for Yusuke to undergo his final test the assimilation of the spirit wave orb, an object of concentrated energy that she's cultivated for years upon years, and also acts as the source of her immense power. But before the true test begins, she gives Yusuke a fake test by asking him to kill her, to which he refuses. To Yusuke, the idea of having to kill the one person that ever taught him anything is out of the question. He shows how much he cares about her in his refusal. Yusuke would much rather run the risk of losing to Tagoro in hopes of finding another way to get stronger than even consider bringing harm to the mentor he's come to care about like family. Once he passes that test, 
He begins the assimilation of her orb into his own body, with the goal being just to not die during the process. We get to see very quickly just how tough the challenge is going to be, as Yusuke is pretty much immediately drowned in pain. Genkai gives him time, but after a while she begins to show her doubts, remarking how young he looks when he's curled up in agony. The longer the process goes on, the more Genkai is having her doubts. Not because she lacks faith in Yusuke, but because the realization sets in that the orb could genuinely kill her surrogate grandson. There's a nurturing air to her as she tries to retrieve the orb from Yusuke, but he refuses to yield and takes it back. Yusuke eventually overcomes the trial and falls into a deep sleep to recover. Genkai mentions that she was worried her impatience to strengthen Yusuke enough to ensure his survival would be what inadvertently got him killed, by her hands no less. It's a touching moment from Genkai, and like with Yusuke, we can see just how far she's come as a character. What I love about this is that it kills two birds with one stone. It gives Yusuke the much needed upgrade he needs to not get obliterated by Togoro, but it also adds heavy narrative weight to that exchange of power. Without her spirit wave orb, Genkai is far, far weaker. Her lack of power is noticed by Hiei, Karama, and even members of the enemy team. The transfer of power hasn't gone unnoticed by Togoro either. After the semifinals, Genkai says goodbye to Kobara and the girls in her own way without setting off red flags for anyone except Kobara's sister Shizuru. Then, without her orb, she goes to face off against Togoro one last time. And this brings us to the motive of the younger Togoro brother. Togoro and Genkai used to be allies, and it's explicitly stated later that they were also lovers. Togoro showed a deep-seated despair at the idea of his mortality, fueling his desire to go beyond the limits of the human body. Genkai, however, understood that growing old and losing their strength was just a part of life. Her identity wasn't tied up in her physical strength the way Togoro's was, and still is. The pair internalized their philosophies on strength and moved forward, going on to fight in a previous dark tournament. Upon winning, Togoro asked for eternal youth and power, while Genkai asked to be left the hell alone. Togoro's motivations stem from his desire to prove his philosophy correct and show Genkai that she was foolish to give up the opportunity that he snatched with both hands. The fact that Yusuke happens to be Genkai's student was just a happy coincidence, the universe inevitably setting these former friends on a collision course. The power to make the most learned techniques and diligent strategies futile is strength absolute, and Togoro intended to demonstrate that. I need water. Genkai wanted Togoro to understand that mortality is something everyone struggles with, and that it's a part of the journey. Knowing you'll get old and eventually die gives each day meaning, and makes you appreciate the small moments. She had even hoped that her spirit wave orb would allow her to return one day to cure him of the madness that had taken hold of his mind. In the end though, Togoro kills Genkai. Yusuke arrives just in time to cradle her during her final moments, where she reveals that Togoro had essentially strong-armed her into participating, likely having realized Yusuke was her student shortly after his encounter with the spirit detective. Genkai's invitation was a request, unlike Yusuke's, yet she joined anyway to help protect Yusuke, but also confront Togoro. She came knowing she would die. It's an Aegean task to watch Yusuke deal with his first true loss, and for it to be his mentor character, a character everyone in the entourage has the utmost respect for just makes the moment hit harder. Keep in mind, Yu Yu Hakusho originally aired in 1992, and then got the dub treatment 10 years later, so this was before every anime out there was killing off characters just to bolster viewer retention. Character deaths in anime back then weren't rare, but major character deaths got people talking. There are very few major deaths in modern anime that I care about at all. Now that I think about it, the only modern anime death that I care about at all is Maze Hughes because unlike Genkai, he stays dead. While Yu Yu Hakusho does fall into the same pitfall as properties like Dragon Ball or Marvel, but to a much lesser extent by which major characters don't stay dead, it doesn't have a MacGuffin to fall back on like Dragon Balls that reset the universe. There was no safety net for these characters, so when Genkai dies, it still carries that suffocating heaviness to it. It's only when you know how things play out that it loses some of its tension. This brand new emotional turmoil brings Yusuke to the final stretch of his character arc in the Dark Tournament. Before he can face the final obstacle of the tournament, Yusuke has to first undergo a very relatable battle with grief. Seeing our typically unshakable hero deal with the loss of Genkai, self-blame, and survivor's guilt really tug at your heartstrings without being too dour. It's just enough to elicit a response and add fuel to Yusuke's fire.
Before we dive into the final round of the tournament, I want to touch on Sakio's master plan. After taking the crime boss that captured Yukina for all he's worth during the prelude to the tournament, he walked away with 66 trillion dollars, and the owner of the winning team of the tournament gets 40 trillion dollars. With over 100 trillion dollars, Sakio intends to create a permanent, stable portal between the human world and the demon world, allowing apparitions of all sizes to pass through unhindered and essentially turn the human world upside down. This idea actually ties directly into the chapter Black Ark, which comes directly after the Dark Tournament. His aspiration to completely redefine the food chain on Earth is what keeps he and Togoro in lockstep. Togoro is always seeking stronger opponents, kind of like a sadistic version of Goku, and Sakio knows he can use Togoro's strength to facilitate his own endeavors. The finals start off on an interesting note, as both Team Yurameshi and Team Togoro only have four combatants, technically making both teams ineligible to fight. However, Sakio shows up as the team's substitute. He has no intention of fighting, but his mere presence grants Team Togoro eligibility to fight. He even goes so far as to stake his life on Yusuke's team losing before his turn even comes up. Koenma shows up as Team Yurameshi's fifth member, and the finals officially begin. The opening match is between Karasu and Kurama, who have developed something of a rivalry during one of the many moments between rounds. What makes Karasu and similarly Bui so interesting is their motivation for fighting on behalf of Team Togoro in the first place. Both Karasu and Bui at some point in their lives challenged the Togoro brothers and failed to emerge victorious. Karasu laid out the threat that if the Togoro brothers didn't kill him, he would eventually continue to grow stronger until the day arrived that he could eventually seek revenge. Bui was given an ultimatum, either defeat Togoro or become his slave. It takes the old saying of keep your friends close and your enemies closer to its logical extreme. Both men aspire to conquer stronger foes in the hope that they'll one day be strong enough to bridge the power gap. It kind of reminds me of Torfin and Askeladd from Vinland Saga. What makes Karasu so dangerous and keeps Kurama in a constant state of frenzy is his ability to use his energy to cause explosions, even without touching his opponents if need be. On top of this dangerous set of skills, he's faster than Kurama's base human form, and he excels at mind games. And these traits make him the perfect antagonist for our favorite redhead. The fight is brutal, with plenty of twists and turns that keep it compelling down to the last second. As was the case with Yusuke, the conclusion of this match offers an explanation regarding Kurama's future increase in power. Bui is the next to square up. Of Team Togoro, I love his design the most, even though he reminds me of Shredder from Ninja Turtles. Another thing that makes Bui so interesting is his lack of dialogue until about halfway through the fight with Hiei. It gives him a mysterious streak befitting of a 9 foot tall walking tank. Bui demonstrates his respect for Hiei by removing his weighted armor, which is less flashy than when Rock Lee removes his in Naruto, but it's still just as cool to see. The pattern continues as the fight gives us an explanation into Hiei's coming power escalation between this arc and the next. I love that the seeds for each character's growth is planted before the arc has ended in order to justify their growth moving forward. The audience has also shown just how far Hiei has come in terms of acts of mercy, as well as his trust in his companions. The following match is between E.T. and Kuwabara, but before their battle can even begin, Tagoro has to bring in a new ring after Hiei and Bui's match reduced it to rebel. Unlike his peers, Kuwabara is the only one that goes into his match with legitimate fear in his heart. Kurama was anxious, but knew that if he could tap into his demon form, he had a chance. Hiei was confident beyond measure, and Yusuke's anger over Genkai's death has completely eclipsed any fear he may have felt otherwise. E.T.'s intimidation works expertly and leaves Kuwabara shook. Even Shizuru can see just how afraid her brother is during the intermission. Not even Yukina's presence is enough to completely calm him down, which is worrying for the audience too. E.T. is the most grotesque contender of the tournament with an attitude to match. He's callous and loud, holding nothing back in his snarky little jabs at Kuwabara. He's the kind of character that makes you honestly forget he was ever human at one point. While his younger brother is composed and calculated, doing only what he needs to leading up to the showdown with Yusuke, E.T. consistently demonstrates an open cruelness to other contenders of the tournament throughout the arc. His traits both physically and mentally make him repulsive on a fundamental level. The emotional crux of the tournament's penultimate battle comes from Kobara's realization that despite his loyalty to them, none of his teammates respected him enough to inform him of Genkai's death. From the very beginning of the final round, Kuwabara has been questioning his teammates in regard to Genkai's sudden absence, yet, given so many chances to bring him into the fold, they keep quiet. 
Truthfully, Yusuke just didn't want to have to admit that Genkai was gone, but it was still wrong for him to leave Kuwabara out of the loop. The elder Tagoro is the one that informs Kuwabara, adding insult to literal injury. Kuwabara may not have been her protege, but he respected Genkai nonetheless, and the pattern continues with Kuwabara's new sword setting the stage for his own power escalation and involvement in the chapter Black Arc. At long last, we arrive at the main event, the rematch between Yusuke and Tagoro. The stakes get raised even higher as Sakio offers up one last bet. The winner between Tagoro and Yusuke will earn two points, effectively making it the final match of the tournament. He wagers his match on Tagoro to win, and Koenma answers the call by agreeing to the terms, wagering his own life on Yusuke to win. It's an interesting situation since Koenma was very much removed from the consequences of Yusuke's potential failure. Despite his threat, I highly doubt Tagoro could not only have broken into Koenma's palace, but also get away with killing him. It goes to show the great deal of trust Koenma has developed for his spirit detective. Before the fight begins, E.T. returns and starts running his mouth. He makes the mistake of disrespecting Genkai in front of Tagoro in a less than tasteful way, and then tries to intrude on the fight with Yusuke. Tagoro knocks E.T. into next week, which, like with several things about the Dark Tournament, sets up a plot point for Chapter Black. Can we just take a moment to appreciate the way Yu Yu Hakusho lines up its dominoes to knock them down later? I, I love it so much. Okay, finally, the match starts. I can't even lie, this is legitimately one of my favorite anime fights of all time. The payoff to all of Team Yurameshi's hard work is so worth the wait, and the emotional context makes every desperate block and furious strike that much more gripping. After the first portion of their battle, things kick into high gear as Tagoro realizes Yusuke still has untapped potential and uses an insidious method to draw that extra power out of him, and kills Kuwabara. Even though the loss of Genkai is a powerful motivator for Yusuke, I truly believe Kuwabara's death is the greater emotional moment. Kuwabara has been a character from day one, having even attended Yusuke's funeral. He's something of a surrogate brother, and while they haven't always gotten along, we've watched their friendship grow from just a pair of knuckleheads looking to scrap into something much more closely resembling family. Yusuke's even shown protective streaks when it comes to Kuwabara. The problem preventing Yusuke from utilizing his ocean of power to its maximum capacity is the wall he's built up between he and his emotions. Yusuke is your typical tough guy that uses humor and yelling to deal with all of his problems, which is why Genkai's death was so difficult for him to talk about. In that way, Yusuke was relatable to me considering how I dealt with the compartmentalization of my own emotions growing up. Over the course of the series, it's easy to forget that Yusuke is still just a kid, and he grew up in a pretty dysfunctional home. His mom is a lush, his dad is nowhere to be found, he's constantly getting in trouble at school or getting kicked out of school, and then he's suddenly thrust into the life or death job of spirit detective. Yusuke hasn't exactly had the opportunity to learn how to handle negative emotions in a healthy way, so to compensate, he's locked his emotions up in a box, but as Genkai has mentioned before, a person's emotions are directly linked to their spirit energy. With Yusuke dividing himself from those emotions, there was no way he could fight at 100%. Kobara's death smashes through those walls, and grants Yusuke access to the strength he needs to bring the nightmare of the Dark Tournament to an end. As Yusuke says himself, Don't you think I wanted to use my power and win this thing and go home? Of course. I just didn't know how to reach it. And now I have to live with that. The Dark Tournament will always be my favorite tournament arc. It has wonderful pacing, memorable characters, wholesome, informative, and bone-chilling character moments, and it masterfully lays the foundation of the following chapter Black Arc. It's funny to think that the original author of the manga would go on to pen another fan favorite, Hunter x Hunter, which I've discussed on this channel before. That show has a tournament arc of its own, but it isn't nearly as satisfying, but it also, in all fairness, serves a completely separate purpose narratively. Yu Yu Hakusho is a classic, and while it does start off kind of slowly, it truly hits its stride with the Dark Tournament. It's an example of how a show can be all about fighting while retaining all of the heart, twists, and character writing that make modern shonen battle anime so compelling. It's almost unanimous across the board that fans of Yu Yu Hakusho place the Dark Tournament as the best arc the show has to offer, and there's a very good reason for that. In my two-part discussion about Hunter x Hunter, I said that the Chimera Ant arc is the most compelling reason to give the show a chance, 
even though you have to slog through the entire series to get there. I'm going to extend that basic sentiment to Yu Yu Hakusho. The Dark Tournament alone is reason enough to give a viewing, and it's only the second major story arc, so you don't even have to wait too long to get there. It's a classic that somehow always gets left out of the conversation for best shown in battle anime, and with it showing up on streaming services, now's as good a time as any to introduce it to a new generation. If you guys enjoyed the video, let me know. These long form videos take a monstrous amount of time and effort to script and edit, but if people enjoy them enough, I'll keep them in mind for topics or media that I have a lot to say about. Be sure to like, subscribe, and especially comment because comments really push the algorithm to show this video to more people. You can also follow me on Twitter where you can give me suggestions on topics you'd like to see me cover, or just say hello. What was your favorite moment in the Dark Tournament? Let me know in the comments below, and as always, thanks for watching.